Okay, recording. So welcome whoever's watching this webinar, the um, Zoonotic Healthy Animals Helping People presentation. Let's get this started here. Um, Jim, real quick, can you tell us how this program came about while we're here? I um, did a, a survey with growers. You know, so we did some, uh, it's basically this is risk assessment. And uh, we asked them, uh, you know, what are the needs on your farm? Uh, what are things you need to learn from cooperative extension? And uh, talking about, um, some we're talking about invasives, uh, pests that they let are native to this country. Uh, so I kind of be IPM, you know, my side of things. And then mm -hmm. uh, looking at livestock, some of it was uh, beginning farmer training and some of it was this uh, zoonotic diseases. Uh, they, you know, there's been a lot of concern of uh, these small animals, like backyard chickens and uh, the diseases that they potentially can carry and how they can transfer to uh, to people from animals. Yeah, that's really important. Cool. And this is a grant, or this is part of a grant funded by the Northeast Extension Risk Management Education Program and the USDA, United States Department of Agriculture, in conjunction with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Ulster County. So I was going to get started here. Let me just make sure I check my email. And uh, cool. We're in good shape. Here we go. What we're going to cover today. First and foremost, you probably should not be licking any of your animals at any time, like this picture here. Please don't do that. But we're going to talk about what zoonotic diseases are and what that means, how they spread most commonly, what are the signs and symptoms of humans and in animals, which are important, so you can recognize that stuff, um, how you can prevent it, and general best practices for biosecurity. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Zoonotic diseases, it's really easy to picture. It's just diseases that can be shared between people and animals. We have been sharing diseases with animals because we are animals for millennia. And in fact, some of them have evolved in conjunction with our evolution. Um, most of our vaccines that we have available now are directly related to zoonotic diseases. Whereas, you know, the first smallpox vaccine was literally discovered because they noticed that milkmaids who milked the cows would get a far less extreme version of smallpox when they contracted it because they'd already contracted cowpox and they're very similar. So anyway, zoonotics are diseases that can travel between people and animals. It's not the kind of diseases that both can get. They literally have to be back and forth, like the flu or like Lyme disease, right? But we'll talk a little more about why those things exist and how they exist in nature. This is an important thing too. Six out of 10 of every known infectious disease are from animals. So that tells you that the evolutionary history of these diseases is, is very long. And that's another reason why eradication is so difficult. So also, you know, animals, we can't really treat all of them at once. So easier to treat people. There's a few different ways that these things spread. First and foremost, we have direct contact with animals. Again, putting your mouth on an animal is never a good idea. It's a really easy way to spread disease. Indirect contact, this picture has someone cleaning out a barn. Sure, cleaning up water, uh, cleaning up waste. I mean, I'm not just manure, like any kind of fluid that comes from an animal could also be really dangerous. We'll talk a little more about that. And there's vector-borne diseases, like literally have a vector. And that means there's something in between them that either harbors or transmits that disease. So this has a picture of a mosquito, like West Nile virus, um, has a, is a vector-borne disease via a mosquito, just like Lyme and anaplasmosis is a vector-borne disease uh, via ticks up here in the Northeast. And then the last part, way to get uh, typical zoonotic diseases is through foodborne illness. Um, uh, we don't, may not consider food poisoning a zoonotic disease, but if, that, if an animal has salmonella or E. coli, which is becoming more and more common because of agricultural practices, um, uh, that's, a, that's literally a zoonotic disease. It came from an animal's manure, you eat it, and now you got it. So those are the four ways we can get it. Direct contact, indirect contact, foodborne, and vectorborne. Now, we know there's a lot of different routes of transmissions. Our body uh, has a lot of different orifices and things that can, you know, way to intake disease in our body. That's why I have such a robust immune system. But the general modalities of transmission are aerosol, where it's in the air, like the flu, like COVID, like we're all dealing with right now. Direct contact, I touch a cow with ringworm, and I touch my face, and now I have ringworm. Fomite means there's something else in between you, like a, um, let's say that water bowl. We pick up that water bowl, the E. coli gets on our hand, now we have it. Obviously, oral, putting your mouth on things, that's a really good way to get sick and very easy. And then vector-borne from the ticks. So that's its own separate category. Because so. Um, it's just such a different thing to have an animal between us. And the evolution of those diseases typically follows that vector. So it's unbelievable some of the evolution of diseases and uh, parasites that we have going on around the world. It, it amazes me. Why do they matter? Well, because people get sick and die. And so do animals right off the bat. Um, most importantly, I think, is that this is not something that affects 
unwell people. Typically, people are going to are healthy to get these things. Like uh, you get E. coli, you'd be a hundred percent healthy young person and in great shape, and still literally die from E. coli and get very sick, depending on the type that you get. Like I said before, ringworm. I've had Lyme twice in the last two years, and it was the worst thing that's ever happened to me medically. I'm pretty sure. I was so sick that I thought I had had cancer for a while. And then as soon as I took the antibiotics, I felt better. But anyway, they're important because they make us sick and they can spread them to other people too. Here's some quick common ones we're going to talk about today and specific to North America. Every area of earth has endemic diseases and zoonotic diseases. And these are just the few ones that we have here. Campylobacteria, E. coli I've mentioned, worms, which is more common than you think, um, influenza, just the flu, ringworm, hookworm, rabies, and leptospirosis. We'll talk about a few of those things here in order. Some of them you've been in contact with you don't even know about. Others you may not know anything about. So the first category is enteric zoonotic diseases. That means it comes from something that you put into your mouth, basically, or it affects your digestive system. So from the top down. So Camplo or Campy is everyone calls it. There's different hosts. It's pretty common in livestock. Um, not, it's a, not a common zoonotic disease, but it is common actually in the hosts themselves. Um, and the way that people typically get that is through undercooked food, contaminated water, raw milk occasionally, and manure. Now, we in New York State is lucky enough to have the option to uh, buy and drink raw milk and raw milk uh, products. Um, and that obviously carries a bit more risk than pasteurization. So I think it's neat that the option is there. Some people claim there's a lot more health benefits. I don't know. But if you want to have the right to drink something that may hurt you, go for it. People drink alcohol. Why not raw milk? So in any case, when uh, Eleanor comes on, she can talk some more about Camflow back because it's not my um, forte per se. The way to solve many of these problems that we're going to talk about is cooking your food thoroughly. It's pretty simple, folks. Get a, uh, a thermometer and make sure that your food is cooked at least by these guidelines. Mostly 160 degrees Fahrenheit and 145 is the big one. Um, especially with uh, really poultry, I think, is the big, is the most common one. So I have a thing I put on the grill. I have a temperature thing. This is the best way that you can do and spend $5 and save yourself a lot of time in the bathroom and being sick. This is the best way to do it is by monitoring your cooking style. So keep that in mind. Speaking of that, E. coli. This is a big one. It causes deaths every year in typically healthy children. Usually there's a lot of different versions of it. Um, it's caused by bacteria. Okay. Again, also can be part or come from undercooked food and contaminated water, raw milk again. And a lot of the latest uh, outbreaks have been caused by vegetables, believe it or not. The, they are a vector from uh, live animals. So what typically I think it's they've realized in the past that animals um, a lot of, in a feedlot, we're talking like a million cattle in, in some places, their waste is actually getting into some of the irrigation for the green leafy um, vegetables. And the big difference between lettuce and let's say typical peas is that the lettuce isn't going to be cooked when you eat it. Boom, there's E. coli waiting for you right there. So that's why it's so important to cook your food very thoroughly um, to that 165, 145 degree mark. Um, the next one I have on this list of enteric zoonotic diseases, again, these are ones that I make give you, cause you distress, um, in your digestive system is salmonella. And everyone's heard of this, and the U.S. has done a really good job of protecting its citizens through education, through warning labels, which we love to do and seem to work pretty well. On eggs and chicken, you'll see anybody who sells any of those products has to have a warning label on it to legally sell it to me. So um, these are the foods right here I think this is important that are associated with salmonella outbreaks as a zoonotic disease. You'll see poultry is the number one, not, pick, not necessarily eggs, but poultry itself. And that means you pick up a chicken, you go hug a chicken, you move stuff in your chicken house. That's a great way to get this salmonella bacteria on your hand and into your mouth. So the thing is, other than cooking your meat the best you can is always to wash your hands when dealing with animals or after. Um, again, we can go about this, I mean, this is that fomite. This is that thing, that object that you pick up that's going to contain this that'll have it. Or it can actually come in. So, or eggs. So always wash your hands after, uh, after touching animals or things that animals have touched too. It's just general best practice anyway. Um, I also want to mention too that reptiles and amphibians are common hosts for salmonella as well. So if you have a pet iguana, like many of you probably do. Just kidding. Maybe you do. If you do, cool. You should also definitely be washing your hands after handling those animals. I know it seems like I'm going a little fast. We have a lot to talk about here today. So um, 
our last enteric disease, I believe that zoonotic is worms. Worms are far more common around the world than people realize. In fact, um, two of my family members that are young kids have worms right now. Uh, whipworms, I think, which is common in children. Um, there are an awful lot of worms that can live in our digestive system. We're lucky in this country in that up here, we don't have many that can survive the winter. They tend to be in warmer stuff like the guinea worms and hookworms, stuff like that. But we can get worms up here, typically through eating um, contaminated fruit, vegetables, or anything else that's contaminated with manure. And a very common host for this is pigs. And I have actually seen worms come out of pigs. Now, I typically don't treat worms with pigs when they have worms, unless it's a really high load. Um, it's just kind of part of their life cycle, but I certainly don't want them in me because it's gonna eat some of my food, if you can believe it, steal some of my nutrition. And so when we talk about on the next slide about some of the um, ways that you know you have these things, that's one of the, uh, that's one of the ways that you know, is if you start losing weight and get sick. So um, yeah, so the, the way you get worms is going out to your pigs, feeding your pigs, and then going home and eating an apple and it's on your hand and there you go, you've got worms now. It only takes that, that little tiny egg right there in the picture, that's all it takes, that's microscopic. That gets in there and you are gonna have a bad time. So the size of animals, this is why it's so important those of you who have livestock and pets is to see your animals every day. Um, the animals can appear healthy just like a human being and then become very sick. Scours, as they call it in animals, diarrhea is a common um, symptom of enteric diseases in animals. So that little critters, those worms are inside them because they try to shed it out through pooping a lot and having a lot of manure to push those worms out. And what they do is they just push more worms, more eggs out onto the pasture, wherever you are. And now it's a great opportunity for you to reach down and touch where those eggs are too. So please take the precautions and watch your animals. If you have a skinny animal or an animal that's not thrifty, you're not acting right, the time to move is then. Call Eleanor, call your vet, call me so we can talk about what your treatment plan is. By the time you're seeing symptoms in these animals, it's probably at a level where you're gonna require treatment. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, preventing these animals, is, or prevent, excuse me, preventing these symptoms from animals really goes back to keeping it clean. Now, we can't run a sterile environment and animals don't do well in a sterile, sterile environment. There's good bacteria, and there's bad bacteria, and they're always fighting this war. And we wanna have a little bit of both to keep up the, you know, the progression. I will say at the end of this, we're gonna talk a lot about biosecurity. It starts a lot there. You really can't get these things into your farm unless you bring them on or into your house. So that's why you see boot dips and boot scrubs and booties when you go out to certain sites. I highly recommend those things um, to uh, help you not bring any diseases home. Deworming for parasites is important. Again, you can talk to Dr. Ackworth, you can talk to myself about deworming. There's a lot of stuff that goes along with deworming to not exasperate the problem to make it work. So if you are gonna deworm, it's best you have some guidance. If you are deworming the same time every year, if you're deworming with the same drug all the time and you're not dosing them correctly, you are gonna, that treatment's gonna fail. And you may actually end up making your parasite problem worse. So if you are considering deworming, you need to talk to a vet or a professional about that system. And more times than not, quite honestly, you probably can't get the most effective dewormer without speaking to a vet anyway. And then obviously having routine vet care. I'm all surprised at how many times I go to some large animal farm that, and they don't have a vet or even a dog or a cat. Get that started, treat them well, be nice to your vet, send them a holiday card at Christmas because they're the one that's coming to your house at three in the morning when you have an emergency. And having a relationship with that person beforehand is super important. So. That's how to prevent disease in animals. Biosecurity, keeping things clean, all right? And then having a vet. Of, uh, of enteric diseases in humans are pretty much the same, but we tend to have a larger range of uh, ailments because we can discuss them and speak on them. So obviously diarrhea if you're sick, vomiting, fever, nausea, dehydration, and stomach pain. These are all things that have to do with your body and things that live in your stomach and intestines. So um, if you do have these symptoms, you need to go to the doctor and talk talk to a healthcare professional about it. Preventing them in humans um, is pretty easy. We've talked about the things right now. Cook your food and wash your hands. It is as simple as that. It is beyond effective. So if you're handling animals or manure or anything else, or even raw meat, keep that in mind. Um, or you're washing lettuce even. Make sure you wash your hands after. And then cook your food to appropriate temperatures. That's another one that's super important. In humans. Real quick, here's how to wash your hands, because a lot of people don't know. You got dirty hands, you wet your hands, you put the soap on, you scrub for 20 seconds, you rinse, then you're dry. Um, 20 seconds is a long time, so really scrub. And like me, if I'm out with the animals, I'm gonna wash my forearm too, I'm gonna get the whole thing. 
because I want to make sure that I'm clean and not bringing anything into my household. I like it. Um, 20 seconds is right there. I made it red so you know. 20 second hand wash, best case scenario. So I tell people this and they say to me, well, I've never gotten E. coli. I've never got salmonella, but how many times have you had diarrhea and not really known why? I guarantee you it's happened to you at some point probably. Um, because these signs and symptoms are often overlooked by healthy people. You may have stomach distress, you know, or nausea, and that could be a direct result of a low grade infection with something. So it happens more than you probably think. And therefore, by deduction and by logic, um, it's probably severely underreported in reality. So just keep that in mind. Um, and you can develop immunity due to some diseases. I know on um, a anecdotal level that I have gotten somewhat uh, in some immunity to Giardia because I drink a lot of the pond water at the farm. The first few years I got sick and had all the things. And now maybe once a year I might get a little bit of stomach ache from drinking the water. Generally, it doesn't affect me as much. But I think that I've grown a little bit of immunity. And that's a great thing. That's one of the reasons that we actually kind of like having, uh, not like having, excuse me, Parasites are part of the overall system. They serve a purpose, and that purpose at times is to uh, make our immune system more robust and more powerful. So that's why I mentioned earlier when I do see a few whipworms or, and pigs or tapeworms, I tend not to treat them unless it's really bad. They can die from tapeworms, especially some small ruminants, but pigs, stuff like that, I'll usually let it be unless I can tell the animal's being infected. If I have a big, fat, happy, acting normal animal, then I'm not going to go ahead and just worm the heck out of it. Um, because like I said before, it can cause even more problems in the long run. Okay, we talked about enteric diseases and now we're gonna move on to a different category of zoonotic diseases that affect humans and people called vector-borne illnesses, like Lyme and West Nile. And vectors, like we spoke before, a very common vector also is a mouse, if you think of the plague, um, and fleas, are insects that carry to transmit diseases, bacteria, viruses, and other parasites to you. So, if you look at the picture, we have mosquitoes, biting flies, fleas, which we spoke about, also have a part in the plague. Mites and ticks are all things that can affect you. I will say about mites, animals and people really don't share mites and lice, but there is a mite and a lice for every species. So there's a different, there's a different lice and mice for poultry, cattle, and humans. And there aren't many that you could share. There probably are some, but in general, they're pretty much uh, very species specific. But the tick one is one that um, has affected me recently, and there's been an explosion of multiple tick-borne diseases uh, in the area. They're still trying to figure out and sort it out. Luckily, there's an easy cure for it, doxy. Luckily, the uh, science is telling us that it's not going to stay in our body after it's been treated, so it's not, you know, uh, something you need to worry about, hopefully, after you take the drugs. Um, the other thing we see is uh, carrier vectors are flies and cockroaches. Um, they're not dirty animals per se, but if you have a cockroach at night, they're running across your fruit and vegetables that you keep out on the counter. That's going to be an issue for us to keep that in mind. This actually is from India, which I really like this poster. And they talk about some of the foodborne illnesses. And the global deaths down here, a lock is 10,000, is 100,000. So that's 190,000 people die every year around the world from vector borne illnesses. So I talked a little bit about Lyme disease already. Um, that's the bullseye rash people get. This is zoonotic because it's coming and being shared for by animals. You know, you got the bullseye malaise. You're not feeling well. That's typically the uh, way you can diagnose it. Um, and also, if you're in an area where it's endemic, there's not a lot of, as far as I know, Lyme in Arizona because it's too dry. There's not many ticks there. But up here, we know it's a pretty common uh, ailment. Um, they say it's difficult to cure chronic infections in people. The science is saying that may or may not be true. The jury's out. We all know. And it's not worth arguing about it over here. Um, prevention, obviously, there's a million things. Cornell can hook you up with a million different prevention techniques, like tucking your pants into your socks, wearing uh, appropriate uh, uh, repellents. Works great. Promethean or uh, whatever they use now. Um, anyway, if you're going to be in the woods, if you're going to be in mixed woods, your best bet is to find yourself or Take the precautions to not get sick. Take it from me, who thought I had cancer, blood cancer. I was so sick with Lyme, uh, and I couldn't get out of bed for a week. This is something you want to take seriously. Um, more Lyme disease stuff. It's very common in dogs and horses. My dog's also been treated twice for it. Again, you know something's wrong with the dog when it's acting funny. It doesn't have any energy. Uh, a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, the dog will start to become paralyzed, possibly, because it's so, uh, in their, it's so, there's so much of the disease in their body. And at that time, sometimes they don't make a full recovery. So keep an eye on your animals. 
Uh, cats don't get it, not sure why, but we got some more stuff, cat stuff later that they're terrible with. So we'll get to toxoplasmosis later. Um, the deer tick is the one that do it. I don't think this is a deer tick right here, but I'm not sure. You can look, I can, I'll send out um, updates and I'll put them in the link to this on YouTube if you want more resources for that. Um, generally, the tick needs to be attached for 24 hours as a zoonotic disease, but they're finding some of the other disorders are not, don't have to be on that long. So any tick you find in the resources, I also put a link to a place where you can send a tick in a plastic bag, they'll analyze it for free and send your results via email and tell you if it was positive for any of the uh, many different diseases they test them for. So take Lyme seriously, take ticks seriously. And okay, here we are. I don't have a picture on here. I like to have a picture on every slide, but toxoplasmosis has been in the news a lot lately because it's spread by cats. And a lot of people are infected and probably don't know that they're infected overall. Generally, it comes from cat's manure. That's why they also say pregnant women shouldn't be cleaning litter boxes because uh, this can cause problems for fetuses. Um, and again, how do you prevent this? Wash your hands. You touch, you clean out the litter box, you come back up and you eat an apple or whatever you're doing. You touch the couch, you come back later, you have a soda in your hand, it gets on the soda, boom. So you need to wash your hands after doing things with cats. That includes picking them up. There can be fecal matter on the cat that you cannot see. If you're cleaning the litter box, that's important too. So keep that in mind. Washing hands and cooking your food are the two best ways to prevent this type of thing, okay? This is the cycle of octoxoplasmosis. So you can see down here the end stage intermediate host. It is with some of the things that happen in other animals, we're not the end host. That, that uh, toxoplasmosis does not want to live in us, but it gets into us accidentally and can survive. Um, that's why cats and some people, I, I assume, don't show a lot of um, uh, symptoms when they do actually contract it. And then some people have very bad symptoms, okay? It's however that uh, toxoplasmosis manifests in your body that's gonna cause problems. And again, we can see that the intermediate host can be a mouse or a rat, and that's a vector, to the cat. Cat gets it from them. Cat poops out those eggs. You accidentally touch it, and then boom, you got it. So something to keep uh, uh, a watch on if you have cats as a zoonotic disease. Now, lepto is another bacterial disease um, spreads through urine of infected animals. This one's a pretty big one for um, livestock owners too, um, because it can live for so long in the soil for weeks and months, especially if you have a lot of mice or rats in one area, that lepto can live in the soil there for months and it can become host. Again, that's why it's prudent to be wearing gloves if you're digging out a chicken coop and take a shower and wash everything else. Um, it is found in water. So you'll see here mammalian reservoirs are mice and rats. It comes out in their their urine, contaminates the mud, water, and soil. And then we're out there doing these things, planting, canoeing, fishing, bathing, anything out there that's gonna maybe bring us in contact with urine. And then now we have the lepto in us. Um, I'm gonna have uh, uh, Dr. Ackworth talk more about lepto. But again, this isn't to scare you, but there's a lot of ways that you can share zoonotic diseases with animals. And again, the best way to prevent it is by washing your hands. Bookworm, another worm. Um, again, we don't seem to see this as much. The reason it's important, though, is because cats, like toxoplasmosis, often carry this. So uh, puppies and kittens are very susceptible to hookworm. Um, and you can get it just by putting your foot on bare soil. That worm or can get into your body and start expressing itself like that. I'm showing these pictures so you can see what hookworm looks like. Um, and yeah, another thing to watch out for, but again, you shouldn't be out cleaning your chicken coop with bare feet or sandals. You shouldn't be out working on the farm in sandals and open toe shoes. It's not only is it a good way to step on a nail and get tennis, but it's also a good way to expose yourself to lepto or possibly hookworm or even ringworm or anything else that can come uh, through your skin to make contact. Now, the enteric disease we talked about come through your mouth and affect your digestive system. These are more external issues, the hookworm and the ringworm and those things. Um, so they're coming in via a different delivery system. They're not coming through your mouth, although they could. They're coming through your skin. Um, ringworm is really common in livestock. Uh, there's a picture down here of a cow with it. Um, it's actually considered good around my holistic farming circles because they believe it helps boost the immunity of the animal. It's not permanent. Those, those round ringworm spots will fall off and the fur will grow back eventually, typically. This is a young person with ringworm. I think I've had it before. 
like I said, it's so common. I'm not, I don't remember, but I think I've had it because if you're working cattle and they have it on their face or somewhere else, they're giving injections, or if you're working that animal, it's going to get on you too. How do you prevent it? Wear gloves, wash your hands. Simple as that. Okay. There's also some miscellaneous zoonotic diseases that I want to speak about. Um, some things like lepto can be spread through um, birth fluids. So keep that in mind. If you are a pregnant woman or anybody, if you are working inside of an animal, vaginally, anally, or even orally, you need to have gloves on. Um, these types of things, they don't even know all the mechanisms of it, can actually cause um, people and animals to abort babies. So. If you are inside an animal that's giving birth or having trouble, you need to have gloves. In fact, I recommend you go to your favorite farm supply store and buy yourself some full arm gloves because you know as I will, as well as I do, many of you do, if you are moving out triplets or quads or even twins out of a lamb, you are going to literally be up, you know, into your forearm inside that animal uh, reaching around. And that's a really good way to pick up some really terrible diseases. Again, the way to prevent these things is so easy. Gloves, wash your hands, and take precaution. This is PPE, folks. Just like we're talking about everyone wearing their mask. This is personal protective equipment. It's the first line of defense. Um, so make sure you have appropriate. I have gloves in my car, in my wife's car, I'm in my briefcase, in every drawer in the house because I want to take the precautions to keep myself and my family safe. Plague is also another one. And yes, that plague is still active around the world. Transmitted from fleas and rodents, those are the vectors, into other animals and humans. People die of the plague and there are outbreaks all the time. Typically, I think it's in the Indian provinces, in India, but I'm quite sure and quite certain there are probably cases of plague that are occurring in the United States as well. Um, we're not gonna go into a lot of talk about that, but again, something else to keep in mind. Okay, let's review real quick what I've talked about. We talked about diseases that enter through your mouth and affect your digestive system and your internal digesting and make you sick and cause diarrhea and vomiting. And we've also talked about some vector-borne diseases like Lyme disease or West Nile virus, which again also uh, was causing birth defects in babies, if you remember. So this is stuff to take serious. Um, we had some, um, we talked about toxoplasmosis with the cats and lepto from the urine in the soil. So like if you're out cleaning out a, a dirt closet or dirt floor outside your house or shed, that's a really good place. There could have been a bunch of uh, mice or rats or chipmunks urinating on the ground and, and contaminating that soil. We also talked about some things that are co contracted physically, like hookworm and ringworm. You touch that animal and it passes on to you via the skin. Um, not something you want. So there's a million ways to get a disease. And there's really two ways to prevent it. Wash your hands and cook your food. Okay. Uh, and we also talked about plague and uh, how important it is for women and everyone to be wearing gloves when, whenever going inside of an animal. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is the flu, influenza. It's zoonotic. It's, you guys know. Hey, Eleanor. Hi. I've been trying to join for like the last 20 minutes. I, heard I saw you. No big deal. Let's take a step back. Can you see my screen or are you just on your phone? I'm on my phone. Okay, no problem. So I just want to go back and have you talk about a couple things real quick. So yeah, I got you up to the different different diseases and that kind of thing. And that's as far as I got. No problem. So I just want to have you just quickly talk about these things uh, so we can get a sense of, about them. The first one is going to be E. coli. And we talked a lot about how people get them and the causes, but can you give us your two cents on E. coli specifically from a prevention standpoint? Well, there are several different varieties of E. coli. Some are worse than others. Mm -hmm. um, and it is usually said in, the, in manure from whichever animal. I mean, I've experienced with a cow using an E. coli mastitis and E. coli um, inte intestinal disease. Okay. And if you expose their manure and you don't wash your hands, you can get uh -huh. it from that. That's great. We've talked a lot about hand washing already. So, yeah, yeah. so um, in, the, in the cattle, it tends to affect the very young, the calves, okay. they get nasty diarrhea. Yeah. Uh, and it can be life threatening. Yeah, okay. And it can be life threatening for people too, right? Yes, for my same signs and people, yeah. So if you get it, you're pretty sick. Okay, pretty scary. Um, and if not, there are some E. coli that are resistant to certain antibiotics. So oh, concern. yes. Certain, uh, certain farms I've been to have their own variety of E. coli that is resistant to the usual antibiotics. Oh, sorry. Can you introduce yourself? Because I don't know if people know who you are. <laughs> uh, I, I, can, can you see me? I don't see me. You can see no, me. No, right I don't here. see you on the screen. 
Let's oh, we can hear you. Oh, there you go. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, um, Dr. Eleanor Ackworth, a veterinarian. Um, I've been working on multiple species for almost 30 years. So, <laughs> and what's the name of your what's the name of your practice? All Animal Veterinary Services. And we will be putting out the links to this video on YouTube when we send out the uh, other stuff. How about salmonella? What do you got to say about that? Also, salmonella, everyone hears about it in poultry, but ruminants carry it too. Mm -hmm. uh, reptiles, we have a little gecko could get out later. Um, yeah. Carry salmonella and it's passed in the newer, but because they don't take baths, it's all over their bodies. So when you handle these animals, you can contract the salmonella. Okay. And it just like in people and animals cause the same thing, usually nasty diarrhea, fever, uh, and can be resistant to certain antibiotics depending on which strain you have. If you get real bad, you end up in the hospital. Okay, good. I forgot about the resistance thing. That's a really great point. Actually, salmonella right now, they have they have made certain antibiotics, certain antibiotics, use of certain antibiotics in food animals illegal because yes. the only antibiotics that work for salmonella in people. That's great. Okay, that's a good thing, I assume. So, um, The next thing we talked about quickly was um, worms and internal worms that people and, and uh, animals can share. Yeah, well, the hookworms, dog hookworms, people can get. Uh, yeah. You get... Kid, your kid playing the sandbox, they can get worms if the cat or the dog use that as a litter pan. Yeah. It's something that's fecal oral. So if someone cleans the litter pan and doesn't wash their hands, they can get worms from their cats. And Most how do you usually know when someone has it, like a person, an individual? Well, there's one variety where you can get um, a larval migraines where you get a rash on your skin. If you're walking in an area where there are a lot of these uh, immature worms and they migrate through your skin into your body and then can it in the intestinal tract. They can also migrate other parts of your body. For example, years and years ago, there were people in Africa were going blind because the worms migrated to their eyes. And then ivermectin came along and they treated people and now they don't get it anymore. Well, that's a good thing. Okay. It's called aberrant migration. When you worms that are not supposed to be us, they don't know where to go. So they wander around our bodies and cause havoc. Yeah, that's much like the barber pole worm in goats and sheep, right? We're, or excuse me, the mingelial worm. Yeah, mingelial worm, yeah. Um, we talked about prevention and then we moved on to um, washing hands, obviously. Talked a lot about that. And then um, the next category was vector borne diseases. Specifically, we started talking about Lyme for a bit. And I've had Lyme twice in the last two years. The question with that is that what's the true definition of zoonosis? Zoonosis, I believe, is directly between animals and humans. Okay. The Lyme disease and other tick diseases have to go through a tick. So is yep. that still considered a zoonotic disease? Or is that just a disease that multi, multiple species can get? Because horses I don't know. and yeah. dogs can get Lyme disease. Yep. You know, and cats and cows and sheep and goats don't get Lyme disease. And it has yeah. to go through a tick. So yes. I was wondering, I looked at the definition, it says disease between human and animal. So is Lyme really a zoonotic disease or just a disease that many species can get? Yeah, that's a great point. But being so prevalent as it is, you know, yeah. it, it, we might as well just talk about it. So. Right. And I've had it. Have you had Lyme? Or have you seen a lot of Lyme in your area? I've had it back in the 90s, but I don't oh, Okay. I've so I've had it twice the last two years. So the most yeah, it's very common. Uh, we test animals all the time, dogs all the time for it. Yeah. Pretty much dogs and, and horses, here, the other species that get it. And the prognosis is good for dogs, you would say? If you treat them soon enough, most cases clear up in 24 to 48 hours. Yeah. If, it's, if they aren't treated right away, it goes on long. There is a, so, some chronic Lyme or Lyme can seem to get in the joints. And, okay. it, and dogs can cause acute kidney failure, which is life-threatening. Oh. Die oh, I actually just heard of a friend of mine's dog that happened to you. I forgot. Yes. Yeah. If dogs get it, bad news. Wow. It's still treated. That's terrible. Okay, here's one I know is near and dear to your heart. Toxoplasmosis. Can you talk yeah. about that? Yeah, and most people don't know about toxoplasmosis unless they know someone's pregnant. Toxoplasmosis yeah. is a parasite that cats carry. It can make cats sick, but not always, but cats can carry and they pass it in their feces. And if they go poop in your garden and you don't wash your vegetables, then you might end up with toxoplasmosis. If you're not pregnant, it usually is not a problem. In a rare occasion, it can cause neurologic disease in people. Okay. In pregnant people, it can get into the, the baby and the... Um, and, the baby will die. Or okay. So your recommendation. Cat, so would you recommend that people get rid of their cats or just not clean the litter box? If they're no, if, if you, are, you are planning on being pregnant or could be pregnant, you just clean the litter box. As long as you clean it, you get someone else to clean the litter pan, or even if you're all by yourself, if you clean the litter pan every day, then you should be safe and you wear gloves if you're worried about it because it takes time for these protozoa to sporulate in the cat's poop. 
So, so it takes time for the eggs to hatch in the poop. Yeah, exactly. Sort of. Cool. So if you're in the middle pan every day, you get someone else sticking in the middle pan. Okay, so okay, that's great advice. I didn't know that. And that, that parasite also can cause neurologic disease in other animals. Very rare. Cows, goats. Really? Okay. Yep. Um, how about lepto? Leptospirosis uh, is now on the radar in the veterinary world because all of a sudden it's a new disease. Actually, leptospirosis has been around for a long time. There are many, many mm -hmm. strains. Most of the dog vaccines carry three of the strains. They're the more common in dogs. But what happens is dogs, cat, raccoons, and rodents, and all these animals can carry different strains, and they urinate in your house, hopefully not, but in your backyard mm -hmm. or in a puddle, and then the dog is exposed to the urine on their feet, or when they drink out of the puddle, they can get the leptospirosis. And okay. they strains but it tends to cause kidney and liver failure and by the time okay. you find out it's often too late uh, but it's in the vaccines what happens is in the canine vaccine the veterinarians stop giving it because it tends to cause a reaction the dogs will get really really sore so a lot of veterinarians okay. stop giving it like I don't know, 10 years ago and now suddenly the, the disease is here again Back. it's you can see it in new york city because they have rats you see it up here because we have raccoons and foxes and all the other animals um, you know, and, and people can get it. So my staff has been instructed, we don't always, when we go outside to get a urine sample from a dog, you take them to a walk, you wear gloves because you could okay. get from the urine from the dogs. So people, your owner can do that too, although we don't usually collect What are the, um, the signs that humans may be, have been exposed? Uh, fever, fever, good question, I know the strain. Fever, I think kidney problems. And you are a vet, I forget, you are not a human MD, so. <laughs> I realize some of these are going to be difficult for you to answer. Okay, well, you mentioned yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's some of the skin migration I was talking about, the hookworm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this comes through the skin, correct? That's how it gets into your body? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's also going to cause fever in general. You're not going to feel well, and you may even have these lines on your body. Well, I think these, I think these rashes are usually very itchy and not necessarily have a fever. But if, oh, okay. the, worm, if the worms migrate through your skin, they can wander around your body, like I said, and end up in weird places. Like and that's really, so you want to treat this, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. For example, my, of... when my kids came to work with me, when they mm -hmm. were babies, my son had a pacifier and it would fall on the floor and got me very nervous. So I asked the doctor if I should deworm my kids. And he <laughs> thought, oh, looked at me funny. And I said, well, <laughs> in the Caribbean, where this is very common, and my kid's pacifier falls on the floor and does not necessarily get washed. Yeah. So I deworm my children, but yeah. everyone thought it was weird. Oh, I mean, that, they give ivermectin for that typically, right? Even in other countries. Yeah, but it's a little, it's a little strong for a child, but yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. You just got to be careful. So, um, hookworms and ramblings can be treated with multiple medications. A lot of them that work on those, depending on how strong a medication you want to use. Okay. So they're some very safe ones. Great. Okay. Ringworm is one that I've had a few times for my cattle. Um, do you see a lot of this at your practice? No, not a lot of it's there. Cats yeah. carry Cats carry it, so if you have a cat that's losing hair, you always have to suspect, suspect it. The typical okay. thing is a round area of hair loss, usually on the head, on cats, dogs, cows, everybody has it. Um, if a cow has ringworm, they cannot go to the fair because it's contagious to the other cattle. Yep. And, and yes, I got it once from, cat, from cows. I've got it from cattle too. They always touch heads when they meet, I think, and that's how they give it to each other, so. Yeah, well, yeah, also, but it goes around, like you talk about fomites, mm -hmm. they, eats in the feeder or drinks water at the water trough and they yeah. touch it and then the next cow touches it yeah so you, yeah. See, a lot of, you see a lot of the young ones because once they've had it they don't seem to get it again yes people we seem to get it, we seem to be able to get it several times but the cattle yes. seem to all know when they're young and then they're good for the rest of their life unless okay. they're if you have a rash get it checked out simple as that folks yeah, typical circular circular red rash it's not that terribly itchy yeah 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 um I just want to talk a minute real quick because you had mentioned this about after birth fluids and birth yeah, fluids. Very important. Yourself. All you are doing on people when you're birthing babies. Yeah. I don't know. The, um, the placenta can carry different diseases. For example, that toxoplasmosis I mentioned. Yeah. In the placenta. So when you're getting your hand, you're trying to deliver a baby cow or kid or lamb or whatever, and you get placenta on your hands, you need to make sure you wash your hands afterwards because you potentially could be exposed to a disease that might be in that animal, for example, the toxoplasmosis. There's other diseases, Neospora, um, that is another protozoal disease that you can get from doing that. Okay, and uh, plague was one that comes up a lot. Do we have plague in the US or in North America? Not here, not here, fortunately. Okay. I'm in Colorado. Well, 
yeah. yeah. Fortunately, the yeah. disease. But that's also another vector-borne one, right? Typically spread by fleas and mice. Yes. However, with these days people traveling a lot, an animal mm -hmm. could contract it in another state on Colorado and then travel here and get sick here. Wow, interesting. Sure. Yeah, anything, anybody that travels can bring different diseases from different parts of the country. Sure, sure. So we are required to write health certificates for any animal that crosses state lines, which yep. doesn't tend to happen very often around here. Mm -hmm. And although the animal may be healthy today when I look at it, it may show up with the disease two, two to four weeks later. So anytime yeah. someone gets a new animal, we're talking biosecurity here, you're supposed to quarantine them. Yeah. So they don't give your, your animals that you have any of these diseases. And you're saying 30 day quarantine is the general like? Um, two weeks, most people do. Okay. Okay. Four days a night, depending on what species. When an animal comes into the US, does it have to quarantine for 30 days on the way in? Uh, depends on which species, but they have a very strict quarantine for yeah. for horses. Dogs, no. There's like okay. no quarantine. Wow, well, I didn't know that. Okay, yes. good to know. Right, bring whatever disease they want, which I already am familiar with some of those diseases. <laughs> okay. All right. The next thing we're going to talk about. Can you see my screen, Dr. Ackworth? Yeah, I can. It's small, but I can see it. Yep. Oh, sorry. So next thing we're going to talk about is the flu virus, because it is another zoonotic disease. You know, we're dealing with it right now with COVID in the air, and it's changed our entire world here. Um, obviously, animals and people can get it, and supposedly that we shared uh, some space with a bat, and that may be the vector that caused the human reaction. I'm not sure, though. Well, it's not the vector that was, I believe it was a mutation. Okay, okay. The flu, the flu vaccine, the flu in, flu in people is usually a mutation of a flu virus in, in a pig or a chicken, and now it happens to be a bat. So the flu vaccine that we make every year, apparently, this is what I heard, is they think it's a mix of either, either swine or avian flu. They, it mixes, you mix the two animals, and then it can mutate and then infect humans. That's why we don't have, sh we typically don't allow poultry and pigs to live in the same environment. Is that correct? Right, right, right. We do have avian influenza in this country, and being in 4-H, this is a big deal yeah. because it swept across the country several years ago, and the fair was closed to poultry. It was yes, three years ago. Right. And it's still out there. So I have to keep yeah. our... Keep our eyes open for those kinds That's of That's really interesting. Um, oh yeah, here we go. You were just talking about this thing mutating and here we go where you're seeing through poultry to people to pigs then back to people and we can throw a bat in there too or whatever. Yeah. But pretty serious. I have these signs of flu in pigs and I've definitely seen it in both species before but like we talked about before in the beginning, is the animal thrifty, losing weight, does it have diarrhea? Are you seeing like a people like discharges out of their nose and eyes? And it's generally not feeling well. Yeah, the avian flu, they're, they get all swollen up around their eyes. They have cloudy discharge from their eyes. There are many respiratory diseases in chickens, and avian flu is one of them. Mm -hmm. But if you have a bunch of sick chickens and you send a bird to Cornell to be tested, they will test it for avian flu. And we so can do, if anybody would like to know about that, if you have a large number of animals die, especially poultry, contact one of us so we can talk about it. There could be something yeah. serious. Um, so do you see a lot of flu or avian flu in your practice? Well, no, I mean, I hardly test any, but I do see respiratory disease in chickens. Um, and how do you, you just see that because they're sick? And then how do you, what do you- Several, several <laughs> varieties of chickens that manifest as respiratory problems. Some okay. of them are the upper respiratory, the eyes, the comb, you know, the mouth, clogged nostrils. That some are down inside in the air, air sacs and in the lungs. Okay. And, and you know, when it, Chicken gets sick with these things, you gotta get the right antibiotic. I recently had someone over um, towards Connecticut that raises meat birds, and they have all of them divided in different age groups. And his father went and bought a bunch of chickens at the auction and put okay. them in with the meat birds, and they all got sick. And did they uh, so, so they brought me some chickens, I looked at them, and I had a feeling it was something called mycoplasma. So we put them in antibiotics, and they only lost. I think it told them to do 10 birds. They got lucky. Oh, that's not bad. Right okay. right now. But they're all I have stunted. seen, yeah. I've seen the entire flocks wiped out from stuff like this. Exactly. So we got it soon enough. Yeah, they did not catch it soon enough and they all died. It's terrible. Okay. Yeah. Um, so while we're here, I have on here the things to do. When you, let's say you have one sick chicken that you notice. So what's your next step, Dr. Ackworth? Like you see- well, well, If you're talking guys, chicken, any animal, if, you're, if you have a flock of sheep, or chickens or whatever, and you have one sick one, mm -hmm. usually needs some TLC. So you take it out and get, put it in its own space so it won't get stressed, its own food, its own water, and depending on the temperature, you know, have a, a nice warm temperature in the winter, in the summer, hopefully not so warm. Mm -hmm. um, and 
can monitor their eating, their drinking, their weight. Also, you take their temperature. If you call me, I'm at, one of the first thing I'm going to ask is, what's their temperature? And then you watch. If anybody else gets sick, then you might have a contagious disease. And then you have to worry about your whole herd or flock getting sick. Okay. And uh, we talked a little bit about quarantine. So can you give me like a typical quarantine procedure for an animal that you buy or something? Quarantine means separate from everybody else. We have a lot of people believe quarantine means just on the other side of the fence. No, yeah. quarantine <laughs> means no contact with the other animals. So separate, separated by at least 10 feet and, and so that they cannot breathe or cough or sneeze or poop through the fence on each other. So, okay. and then with the quarantine animal, you take care of them first. You wear clean shoes, clean clothes, gloves if you have to. You feed and water them and then take everything, clean everything before you go to the other ones. Or even better, okay. take care of the healthy ones first and do the quarantine ones later on so you can change your clothes and put them in the laundry. Okay, to try not to spread that. Quarantine, most people don't follow that. You're supposed to. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't know 10, so 10 feet's enough typically? I mean, some animals... Yeah. 10 feet, yeah, yeah. most of them don't. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm saying 10 feet, not like it's written anywhere. But okay, cool. basically, it's not the other side of the fence. Yeah, just know they can't touch each other and they shouldn't be next right. to each other. Well, nothing like sneezing, coughing, just like the COVID. You have to be far enough away, <laughs> they're going to get exposed to whatever you have. Most gotcha. people don't have separate of property. But this guy with the meat birds, he has separate buildings for each age group. Okay. And they, in between each batch of birds, they completely clean it out. So this batch that got sick, was the one building with the auction birds. But then it went to the next building because they wear the same shoes and same everything. So I said, no, 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 you gotta stop that. Awesome. You gotta put separate shoes and boots or whatever you have on and be extra, you know, extra careful. You don't wanna carry anything, the phone might they were talking about, carry anything sure. to the next set of birds. So when we take our birds to fair, or you take your sheep to fair or whatever you take to fair, when you get home, the animal's supposed to be separate from everybody else for at least two weeks. A lot of people don't do it and then they end. Sorry yeah. for it. I've okay, seen the cool. pigs erysipelas. I've seen that many times from fair. Okay. All right. Um, we're still talking about flu here, flu-like diseases. So um, preventing it, um, it says like you're talking about quarantining and not bringing disease onto your farm or your house is probably the best way to prevent that. Is that correct? Right. It's, but flu is a respiratory infection. Mm -hmm. so basically secretions from the body. So just as we know with COVID, if they're coughing, they're sneezing, that's gonna get onto their surroundings. Okay. And if you touch those surroundings and then you go to another group of animals, then they are going to contract it. Gotcha. Is there you know a way to sanitize an area? Wear a, mask, wear a mask and gloves or a mask and wash your hands. Same okay. thing. But if you pick up your chick sick chicken and you hold it and it sneezes, it's on your shirt. Don't pick up another chicken. Okay, okay. Is there any way to sanitize a pen if you had flu there? Like, well, how would you clean that out to bring animals back well, in? Well, I, I have a dirt pen. So either treat the whole thing with lime or dig it the top inch or two off okay. of the bonnet. That's cement. That's easy to clean. Bleach and water. Okay, cool. Most bleach works. Um, there's chlorhexidine. There's betadine, uh, Lysol, Pine Sol. All those things work. Okay, for killing great. Viruses and bacteria. All right, cool. Um, these are just, whoops, sorry. The signs and symptoms in people, obviously, we should, everyone's talking about COVID. It's all, uh, or it's all we talk about now. So, you know, eggs, fever, cough, runny nose, sore throat, the usual. But there are different varieties of flu in people. So mm -hmm. this, one, this one, the reason we're in masks is because this variety of flu is highly contagious through mm -hmm. respiratory secretions. The other flus that we get vaccinated for aren't quite as contagious, but because we vaccinate most people, it also doesn't spread so fast. So it's a great thing to get vaccinated and people should be vaccinating their animals and themselves. Right. And, the, and the COVID doesn't live very long in the environment. So okay. if you can nip in the bud, you know, that's why we're doing all the procedures we have. Sure. Other yeah. influences people can carry for a week or two and may not be as easy to transmit, but have mm -hmm. a longer incubation and they're more hardy in the environment. So someone can get sick, um, at, you know, hours later. Okay. okay. That, that those flu viruses are stronger, just survive longer in the environment. And so, if that's important, like, so the really all you can do is to keep yourself safe out in the environment is just wash your hands, right? And wear a mask yeah. if you need to. Or not, that's right. But yeah, if, you have, if you have animals at home, mm -hmm. kids, whatever, any animals at home, and you go somewhere where there are other sick animals, 
or people, same thing. Then when you come home, you want to clean everything. Mm -hmm. okay. So I have separate shoes for my chickens because I go out on the road. I wear boots when I'm on the road at people's farms. But I have separate shoes for my chickens because I don't want to be contaminating them with any diseases from some other place. Gotcha. And most people have chick sheep and goats and cows and stuff. They more and more are more aware of that and making people clean their boots when they come to the farm and when they leave the farm. Yeah. So I have booties in my trunk that I can give people at all times. So yeah, we had with a swine flu, they're not even letting people on on the premises unless they have to, and they're even washing the uh, wheels of the trucks that come in. Yeah, I've seen that. Wow, how interesting is that? Okay. Um, preventing influenza. We're talking about that right now, but generally what we're getting to is washing your hands, you know, yeah. and taking the normal precautions and get the vaccine, obviously, um, and avoid sick people and animals when possible. Pretty simple stuff, right? Seems like it. Um, who is at risk for getting sick? I keep doing this, sorry. Um, because the flu can be deadly. We know that now with the current flu going around that many 140 something thousand people have died in this country now. Um, is there any other tips you have for keeping us safe from airborne illnesses? Well, you're talking about the flu, but all these other diseases you talked about, mm -hmm. for example, you know, the, the, there's the, we have flu here. Fortunately, pigs and chickens aren't mixed, but yeah. um, when you go out into the world, if you have to check yourself for insects, you know, mosquitoes, ticks, those things can give you these diseases. Then anytime you eat or do anything with your face, you wash your hands first. Yeah. And if you're going to visit someone else who is a person, you're visiting a friend who is sick, you don't know what they have. When yeah. you get home, you wash it. Before you eat anything, wash your hands. But also there are things like doorknobs. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're touching the doorknob going in and out of their house. Or I had my father living with me for a while. I had to be careful with him. So anytime any food was prepared, everyone washed their hands. Okay. Also keeping yourself healthy, you know, exercise and nutrition, all that kind of stuff. Staying hydrated now. That's a good point. We haven't talked about that, but yeah, keeping yourself generally healthy by staying hydrated, eating good food and exercising is a great point. I didn't think of that, Dr. Right, um, but children, you know, children like to play in the dirt. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a tough one, keeping children from getting, um, getting some, picking up some of these diseases. Yeah. So you want to cover your sandbox or wherever the kids play in the dirt. Oh, if okay. They, yes. Yeah. If sure. they go to a daycare, you, they're going to mix a lot of kids and pick up a lot of germs, but Usually it's a good thing because they're going to expose to these things before they get to school. So when yeah. they get to school, they don't miss any. But, you know, they transmit disease between each other, toddlers and little kids, because they don't know. Yeah, and their hands are in their mouth all the time. And God knows where else. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, protecting yourself and pets from zoonotic diseases. We've been talking about this the entire program so far. But vaccination is obviously really important. And we didn't talk about rabies. And I think I forgot to put that in here, but I had a rabid raccoon two weeks ago on my property in my goat pen. I walked up and he was sitting in there. I tried to scare him. He just looked at me and hissed. So we had to dispatch that animal, but it really scared me because there's nothing, I think that there's just something really unnatural about a rabid animal. So are you seeing a lot of rabies at your practice? Um, not a lot of rabies, no, but um, okay. I've been exposed. Um, oh, is that right? Yeah. There is a, an animal that's been vaccinated should be protected from rabies. But if an animal is not vaccinated, they're not protected. So if an animal, say a cat or a dog or a goat or whatever, gets in a fight with an animal and you don't know, mm -hmm. the animal, like you said, the raccoon's acting weird. I had a case of a, a herd of goats where the woodchuck was rabid, was going oh, after the goat. So if you can have the animal tested, that's the best. Yeah. If the animal's tested, then you know. If you don't know, if your dog came home with this huge bite wound on its leg or something, you don't know what it's exposed to. Hopefully your dog is vaccinated. If okay. it is vaccinated, if it's been at least a year, you want to get a booster. Okay. If your dog's never been vaccinated, it has to be quarantined for six months before wow. you come back. But you quarantine the animal for 10 days to see if they show up with signs of rabies. Because okay. if an animal will not transmit rabies unless they're actually sick with it. Okay. So carry the disease for six months, but they won't transmit it until they start showing the signs. Wow. So vaccination is really the best way to go, period. Yeah, we had back in the, when rabies first became, um, started spreading around here back in the 90s, we had all these poor old ladies with little poodles went outside and got bit by something that tell them to quarantine their little dogs. So yeah. it's very difficult. And all these cats, we get cats in here, you know, outside cats, feral cats that are very mean and they're sick and they haven't yeah. vaccinated. So we have yeah. to take precaution with those cats. Only the people who are vaccinated can handle them. 
because if one of my staff gets bit and they're not and the enema ends up having rabies, we're in big trouble. No, it's deadly, right? There's no cure for rabies, what I understand. Right. So. right. right. Um, right. Is there a vaccination for people for rabies? Yes, there is. It's really expensive. Yeah, and insurance typically doesn't cover that, correct? If you get bit, your insurance will cover it. Cover it. If you get bit, yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, again, this goes back to having a relationship with your vet. And Dr. Ackworth, I don't know if you were here earlier, but we talked about treating your vet right because you're the person that may be coming out in an emergency. So getting to know you better, having a relationship with for you, having you come out and do a farm visit and just take a look around is the best thing someone can do to prepare themselves for future vet issues, I think. Yeah, it's a good idea. I'm not supposed to prescribe any medication for an animal I have not seen. There you go. Okay. A flock of sheep. If I've been out to your farm on a regular basis, then I can dispense medication and we can do, you know, sometimes you list the telemedicine thing with the phones and the pictures. So I can give yeah. you advice because I'm familiar with your farm. If I've never been there, I can't dispense medication. I give a little bit of advice, but I could be way off track. But That's true. That's a very good point. And you like, so and you're probably pretty busy, right? You're not gonna be able to usually come out that day. When it's a problem, right? Uh, sometimes it depends. You've got to catch it right. I mean, now they're large animal vets are very rare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, getting us to come out at the last minute sometimes doesn't work. Yeah, sure. That's a great point, though. Um, last thing we're going to talk about, and we've actually been, ta we've been talking about this subject the entire uh, course, is biosecurity. That just means taking security for the biological specimens or biological anything that's coming in or leaving your farm. Um, yeah, and there's a million different techniques we could do. We talked a little bit about already uh, the booties that you wear. So anytime you're going to go to someone else's farm, you know, and you're going to have, like Dr. Ackwood said, she changes her clothes and her boots and her shoes, right? Yeah. And uh, um, obviously you can clean, you need to wash your hands, you can clean your boots off and put that stuff directly in the dry, washing machine so you're not transmitting that stuff. Um, also, biosecurity is part of the quarantine protocol. Like we said before, anytime you bring a new animal, especially something that uh, comes from a place you've never been, should be quarantined for two weeks. And that, like Dr. Ackworth said, 10 feet apart, zero contact, zero fluid contact, zero aerosol contact, and then you can really start feeling better about letting that animal on your property. It's yeah. the, the biosecurity thing was a big deal back when Mad Cow showed up. Oh, that's right. The many, many farms around here actually could get, got signs up saying, you know, no visitors, wash errands before you come in the farm. So this has been an issue in our world, in the veterinary world, for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, we tend to wear coveralls and boots so we can change them. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you have any biosecurity tips? Uh, we've talked a lot of already, but I'm trying to think yeah, if you have well, I can say if you go to a fair or a show, you keep okay. your animals set from the other. Do not, I give this lecture to kids, well, not this year, every year. Use yeah. your own shovel, your own wheelbarrow, your own hay, your own everything. If you share with another farm, you don't know what they have. And you may give them something and they may give you something. So you don't share tools, whether you're a show or a fair. I know okay. some goat people are going to a, a show in Massachusetts mm, sometime in the next couple of weeks. Uh -huh. And what they're doing is, this is more because of COVID, they're going to have little um, pens around their trailers and keep them all separate. So oh, every animals are in their own little pen and they're, I don't know how many feet apart from the next pen. Okay. And I said, well, that's nice, but you need to have double fencing because okay. people will reach over the fence to pet your goat. Okay. That's a great point. I didn't think it's a good idea. You know, because I see double fencing some of the petting zoos with animals that are not supposed to touch because people will reach across the fence and feed them French fries or whatever else and pet sure. them. And then they get the next one, the next one, the next one. Yeah. Uh, do you do any quarantining when you come back from the fair or do you recommend it? Our, our birds is quarantined, yes. And for how long do they go for? Two weeks. Two weeks. I mean, seriously, it sounds, it, it doesn't sound like overkill to me, but it is an extra step you have to do. Yes, but if you want to enjoy the fair, go enjoy it responsibly. Don't bring this home to your place. Right, I have, I've, I've seen abortions after the fair. I've seen, you know, mm -hmm. diarrheas from the fair. During the fair and after the fair, I've seen, like I said, the pigs get erysipelas. Um, uh, chickens, we get mites every year. For, no, not last oh, year. Oh, God. We, we always have mites. Year. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And, um, you know, fair is a wonderful place. You know, people learn a lot. It's really nice to educate, educate the public. But you have to be clean. Yeah, take the precautions. Because it's your responsibility as the animal owner to take care of that animal. And this is part of the overall care, really. So, um, all right, look at. Dr. Ackworth, the first thing on here is what you just said. Don't share stuff with other farms. You're a genius. That's great. And that's right. Keep it clean. That's the last thing you just said, which is funny. 
Uh, also, we just said separate animals for quarantine that are possibly sick and don't bring suspectedly ill animals to the farm, or excuse me, to the fair. That's a big one. That's why we have ag and markets and someone like yourself checking when the animals come in. Oh, Be another point. Another point is sharing trailers. That goes in with the equipment. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sharing yeah. trailers. You all carry, you take your sheep to fair for you. I'll take your, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. My sister on our sheep farm got an ammonia and foot rot from sharing trailers. Oh, gosh. That's probably pretty common, the foot rot. Do you actually end up sending a lot of animals home when you have to do the health check? The state, the state does inspect everybody at the fair, and they do, they're very, very strict. Anyone who's been yeah. to the fair is very strict. And yeah. it, it, a lot of people don't like the state vets, but they have good reason to. So when I'm in an animal, I have to write a health certificate. So it may be healthy today, yeah. but I mean, it won't show up as something when it goes to fair. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. All right, there are some personal zoonotic stories. I've already shared mine about Lyme disease, even though it's vector, not really zoonotic, but you have some stories you want to tell us. Is that right? Can you see me? I don't see me. Can you see me on camera? Yeah, yeah, we can see you. Yeah. Okay. Where's our, our gecko? Let me get the gecko out. Okay, go for it. While you're doing that, I will tell the class that this is the giant pumpkin that we brought a couple of years ago. I'm very proud of this pumpkin. Come on. She wasn't going to want to come. Here we go. Come on, honey. Come on. So I don't have cameras. I don't know what you guys are looking at. Where's the camera? We can see him. Yeah. He's cute. Oh, we just lost you for a second. Back. There you go. Am I back now? Yep, you're back. So this is this is Fireball, my daughter's gecko. Cool. Right. So some people think they're so cute they kiss them, which she mm -hmm. said about Dominella. She's about eleven years old. Uh, she's never been sick, but every time someone comes to the house and wants to hold her, we make them wash their hands afterwards. Okay. And you said that animal is an active carrier. I don't know. No, it's, it's old. Oh. You know, it's been known forever that reptiles can carry Salmonella. Okay. Okay. So they always say, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. If you find a wild turtle out there, they could be carrying more stuff. They could be carrying the lepto and the and salmon. Oh, I didn't this even one. think about that. Wild animals. Yeah. That's okay. Cool. I can't be sure what the pet stores do to, to test animals. You can't test them for animals. Anyway, she's sure. pretty cool. Right now, she's really cool. She turns dark at night. <laughs> That's neat. It's a, it's a very fun story. Next thing on the list was a uh, chicken and salmonella and campylobacteria story. Yeah. Well... Chickens are outside. Yeah, so, you don't have to show us. That's okay. I mean, just everyone knows what chicken looks like. Yeah, so, I think so. <laughs> so um, we get our eggs. We wash. I wash my eggs with soap. However, I use dish soap I, because I'm I'm giving them or selling them to people, and the problem is I don't want to give them any diseases. Okay. Um, our chickens we haven't had any issues with diarrhea stuff. We do. They do get sick periodically, but. Yeah. Thing. I have separate shoes and after right now I meet birds also so I don't touch anything between the two groups of okay. birds. Let's the see. meat birds are in one pen and the other chickens are in another pen. Okay. Because I don't know those meat birds um, I got from the farm that had the respiratory infection but it was in a newer batch but even so I don't want to give them to and my sure. the eggs last longer if you don't wash them because the membrane on the egg that keeps them um, preserves them longer, but because I'm giving them a selling way, I wash them with just soap. Okay, that's great to know. And when there are, so if anybody wants to learn more about that, there are strict laws in New York about what you have to do to sell eggs, and I can help anybody with that. Um, if you'd like, just email me. The next thing I have on here is a rodent. We have a chinchilla play. Raiden, <laughs> hey Raiden. Can everyone see him? Yeah, yeah, he's cute. Come on out, buddy. He came from a petting zoo. Oh, God. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Come here, come here. There you go. Huh. This is my daughter's chinchilla. Whoops, where are you? This is my daughter's chinchilla. Okay, cool. Oh, so he's cool. He came from petting zoo also. Okay. So a uh, petting, you know, that I go to a lot. So he's he can handle him. But mm -hmm. rodent, so if you're looking, there's poop. Up, we clean the tent. There's poop all over the place. Mm -hmm. Rodents poop everywhere. So, you know, same thing is. You can see. Can you see him? Yeah, yeah, we got him. He's, oh, he's a good boy. He begs, he likes to be petted, stuff like that. <laughs> but uh, if you think about it, he's his cage is here in a room yeah. where I have a desk and a computer and stuff like that. You don't want to keep any of these animals in a room where you might be eating food. Okay, so separate he's animal and so food areas. So the dust flies everywhere, and his poop falls out of the cage all over the place. Yeah. So you end up with potential exposure. Okay. 
So same thing with chickens. The first time we got chickens, we had them in the dining room. Oops. Oh, gosh. Because they were babies and they were cute and we didn't think about it. But the dust, because they're going to put them back. All right, push back. Push back. Here. Yeah, when you, you know, most people put a heat lamp over their chickens and that just makes the, the manure dry out and then, you know, volatize and go into the air. So. Right. Yeah. So chicken dust is crazy. It's yeah. Great. Um, you have on here cats, toxoplasmosis, and ringworm. Yeah, we talked about it already. Cats with toxoplasmosis is a big deal with cats. It can make yeah. them sick, and they can give it to people. So you clean yeah. the litter pan. But I work today. I worked on a mobile van, spaying and neutering cats all day. Okay? okay, and the we the one woman likes to kiss all the cats, and it drives me nuts. Yeah, because these are cats we don't own. Mm -hmm. Some of prey, some of traps and stuff. They're cute. She gives them a the kiss, mm -hmm. so she could be picking up this toxoplasmosis. The first picture of the presentation is a kid kissing a pig on the mouth, and we talked that you should not be kissing. Yeah. No touching him out. No, 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 no. <laughs> so you're not even not even on your hands. You're actually direct contact. Yeah. And cats, yeah. And cats carry ringworm. Not really that common. Okay. But they do. If they're missing so, hair. That might be what it is. Yeah. Um, we talked about hookworms, and I talked a little bit giardia earlier. Do you have anything to say about giardia while we're on? Yeah, I missed that part of your talk. That's giardia right. Giardia is fairly common in the dog population. I see it a lot in puppies. Really. Um, yeah, just because they're younger, the more younger animals are more sensitive to these diseases. Yeah. So uh, puppies will get you out of or I mean, it used to be something you only got if you went to Mexico or somewhere but it's here. Mm -hmm. Here in the US, it's all over the place. So it causes a nasty diarrhea in your dog. And if you don't wash your hands, you can get it too. And okay, that's really zoonotic then. Okay, very interesting. Um, the next thing said sheep, goats and cows, we know they get E. coli, salmonella and brucella, but we didn't talk about brucella yet. Yeah, brucellosis is a disease that was very common back in the early 1900s. Um, it's zoonotic, and people got it from the milk from cows because the cows had it. Okay. So, got started an eradication program. And when I started practice in the 90s, it was almost eradicated. So, the uh -huh. government paid the government paid for all cattle to be vaccinated. A special orange ear tag that they would okay. get to show their brucella uh, vaccinated. It was called Bangs disease. And in people, it causes an undulant oh. fever. And it can cause abortions and disasters. So we really, it's, it's only in a few pockets in the US out there. I think Yellowstone or one of those. Yeah. It's oh, been so very, very, very nuts, but it, it is a, a, a disease that was eliminated with pasteurization, which you talked about. Yeah. And back to the cattle. And that's so the same thing as Bangs disease? They're the same yeah. thing? Oh, it's cool. I did not know that. We're selling free state, so I don't have to test cattle if they're going anywhere else. Okay. So have to test their cattle before they're going somewhere else. Gotcha. Um, and I'm not saying sheep and goats, but dogs have their own strain of uh, brucella too. Also very rare. If you're going to breed your dogs, you want to test them. Okay. Okay. Um, we talked about fleas, ticks, worms, and protozoa. Again, uh, bacteria and things that can basically cause diarrhea. We thought about mosquitoes. You, we don't. That's right. From West, West Nile. Nile. Yeah. That was a big deal. How long ago would West Nile show up? It's still out there. Yeah. We vaccinate horses for it. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah. Didn't know that. So, yeah. so I guess really the only way you can help that is by wearing a um, bug repellent. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Not much else you can do other than that. And maybe like dump the water out that's in your yard, they say. Yeah, yeah well, there's very, um, very few diseases weak in the US can get from mosquitoes. But yeah. Like malaria in Africa. Yeah. They just don't go out during mosquito weather. It seems that, you know, like end of the day. Yeah, yeah. I actually had dengue probably 10 years ago, and that was pretty bad. So that from a mosquito, as far as I know. Um, we talked about my experience with Lyme and anaplasmosis from ticks. Again, as many things as you can to control those vectors and keep them off you is how you can prevent them. And if you are feeling, feeling sick, talk to your healthcare provider as soon as possible. It changed my life having that. And that's the end of the presentation. I will be forwarding along Dr. Ackworth's information here, along with her address and her phone number, anything else you need. You have my resources, and I will be sending out a list of resources to everyone in the email that came along with this. So Dr. Ackworth, do you have any uh, parting words for us today? I'll do not know. Uh, you, you, I've sent you the article, there was six out of 10 diseases in humans are, in, are yeah. contracted from animals. Yeah. Uh, they say. It's a lot of them, you can think about it. All these, all these diseases we talked about, you know, or zoonotic disease are very common in the human population. Yeah. Um, and 
you can be germaphobe. Now we all need to be germaphobes because of COVID, but there's a good reason to yeah. be a little bit germaphobe when you're out there, because especially with children, because they don't know how to keep, you know, how to keep their hands clean. Yeah, they sure. Where where they've been, what animals they've been with, in, ten, in case they get sick, it might be something they got from an animal. Yeah, yeah. So these are more common than people think. There's a lot of different zoonotic disorders. There's a lot of different vectors and a lot of different ways to get it into your body, whether it's through your skin, aerosol, or fomites, or you're using someone else's equipment. It's a pretty interesting subject. If you need to learn any more, I'm going to send you these resources. Otherwise, feel free to contact me. Feel free to uh, contact Dr. Ackworth if you're in her area. That's Dutchess County, correct? Uh, well, I live in Dutchess, but my practice in Ulster, so both. Oh, okay. So yeah, so Ulster and uh, in that area, Southern New York. But otherwise, that's our presentation. I appreciate everyone being here. Dr. Ackworth, I'll be in touch tomorrow at uh, follow up. And that's it for tonight. Any questions? There's no one on this right now because, hold on a second. Let me do this. Uh, where is it? Oh, there's me. No one on.